Kia ora, I'm Sharon Brett Kelly. Today on The Detail, on the edge of the Red Sea in Egypt, the resort town of Sharm el-Sheikh is going green in time for the big UN climate change conference next month. The thousands of climate negotiators, country leaders, media people, financiers and industry bosses descending on the town will be able to jump on low emission buses. Their rubbish will be handled by a new high tech system. They'll be able to go diving on the Red Sea's coral reefs that are under restoration and they'll be tapping into eco power. All positive stuff. But do we have any right at all to feel good about something that is overwhelmingly negative? In Australia, about 50,000 people have been urged to evacuate their homes as floods hit the country's largest city. A day of record-breaking temperatures across the United Kingdom. High in the Alps, the mountains are moving. Ancient ice caps are cracking and melting. This highway was one of the only things that didn't flood here in northeastern Bangladesh. No wonder people suffer from eco-grief. Yes, that's a thing. But ahead of COP27, I want to do a bit of a stock take on New Zealand's bid to be carbon zero by 2050. I'm talking to Vincent Herringer, the presenter of This Climate Business, and Newsroom's business editor, Nikki Mando, who's just finished a podcast series called Net Zero, The Road to 2050. So, the outlook. Just how grim or rosy is it? It's pretty bizarre because I'm looking at the whole sort of overview of where we're at um, on this road to 2050. And, you know, I should be super pessimistic. So we're already 1.2 degrees above pre-industrial levels of greenhouse gas emissions. And we're already having hideous things happening to the planet. And there's not a single country that's on track with what it's doing now for the 1.5 degree goal. Not one, you know. <sighs> and there are some which are nearly there, you know, Costa Rica and Kenya and in Ethiopia. New Zealand is highly insufficient in what it's doing to try and get to its 1.5 degree goal. And then I was at a conference this week and somebody said that we need a 77% reduction in carbon intensity in order to reach this, you know, limit warming to 1.5. So there's so many negative things and yet somehow I came out thinking that it was positive so practically everyone who's in the sector when I asked them I was sort of unbelievably why are you optimistic and they kind of went I don't really know but I am COVID too I think people looked at what we did with COVID and they went we did it with COVID. That's been a bit of a an optimistic thing for people in the climate change arena. The one where I didn't feel optimistic was about agriculture. I really couldn't see we hadn't moved anywhere, particularly in New Zealand. Because Hewaka Ekenoa, there's just been an announcement about that. The government is proposing bringing in agricultural emission levies from 2025. It has announced its response to submissions from the Climate Change Commission and the farming partnership, Hewaka Ekanoa. Which is a world-breaking scheme, isn't it? To well, get... it says it's a world-breaking scheme, but basically it doesn't come in until 2025. It's been more than 10 years since we were meant to have um, agriculture in some sort of scheme, you're actually just not doing anything now. So you've got no targets, you don't have to reduce anything, you just wait until 2025 when we've got this fabulous scheme that's going to come in, it's going to be world first and world breaking, but don't worry about it until then. Oh. And, and by in another three years' time, where are we going to be? You know, it's just delaying it and delaying it and delaying it. And that's another argument. So pre this announcement, you went out and did a podcast about agriculture. That left you feeling... Uh, quite pessimistic. Hawaka Ekanoa is in a process, so it's not the first announcement about Hawaka Ekanoa. So the the government said, you've got to join agriculture, you've got to join the emissions trading scheme. And agriculture went, oh, please don't make us join the emissions trading scheme, that'd be really hard. And then they said, well, what if we come up with our scheme? So that was Hawaka Ekanoa, they came up with their scheme. And this is the government commenting on their scheme. So saying, well, mostly we think it's okay, but there are some things which we think... You know, because it's pretty nice on farming. They're pretty lucky to have this rather than some other things that could happen. And, you know, farming's hard and they produce food and stuff like this, but they really haven't had to do a lot. And that was part of the pessimism, I suppose, from my podcast, that they hadn't done much. Mm. And this doesn't really, to me, 
doesn't go tough on farmers. But then I've been at this conference this week. It's all about agricultural emissions. And people are optimistic there too. They kind of go, nothing's happening and that's really bad, but we think we might get there. So it's the same in agriculture when you talk to people. They're sort of unexpectedly optimistic that maybe we'll get there, even in agriculture. In the short term, I'm really pessimistic. Um, and it will get worse before it gets better. And the worse will be in weather, it'll be in disasters, it'll be in crop failures, it'll be in sea level rise. But in the long term, I feel really optimistic. Huh. And the reason for that, I think, is because um, humans are remarkable. You know, we're remarkably terrible, but we're remarkably great also. We've got fantastic survival instincts. We've got the ability, the genius is our ability to cooperate. And we've seen cooperation work before. As a globe, we removed lead out of petrol because we could see that it actually wasn't good for us or for the environment. We've solved the ozone issue. In many ways, we've solved hunger, you know, big asterisks on that because we haven't solved it yet. But the progress we've made in so many indicators is so profound that we, we can solve issues at a collective level. We've done it before and we can do it again. So are you saying that there's probably going to be a lot of suffering and a lot of damage before people bolt upright and say, oh, hang on, no, yes. something really serious has to change yes. now. You, you th think about what, what happened in Australia recently in the last few years with the wildfires. The ring of fire around Sydney is as angry and as frightening as we've seen. Tensions reached breaking point across the Blue Mountains today. But in the last two hours, we've experienced a dry firestorm. Have made climate change manifest to, the, to ordinary people. And until then, Australia was one of the outliers in terms of climate denial and climate action. The government held out for a long time, was eventually voted out largely on climate denial. And what made the difference? It was the tragedy of those wildfires and the terrible images that of burning wildlife. Three billion animals were burnt to death, huge destruction of property, and the knowledge that that's going to happen again. So I think it, you know, we're, in some ways we're terribly slow learners, um, and I, you know, my personal opinion is that that has to happen before we are jolted into making major change. Tell me your story about why you started making this podcast series. I had a real moment when I was at work one day in about 2018 and I was working on, this is working in an, in an advertising or a marketing agency and I was working on an insurance client, you know, so pretty gripping work. <laughs> and a report came through from World Wildlife Fund I was just reading online about with, since 1970, 60% of the world's animals had entered into a period of really serious decline. And I don't know about you, but I read the Lorax when I was a kid. The Lorax by Dr Seuss. It's a cautionary environmental tale for children. Welcome to Sneedville, a city, they say, that was plastic and fake. Buzz, buzz. And they liked it that way. No nature, no flowers, no one seemed to mind. But so it's roughly the same time period that the law, between the Lorax being published and now it is the time when that 60% decline, and it's continued right since 2018. And I thought... When I was a kid, I thought in 1970, the adults are in charge, someone will stop this. I was profoundly affected by the Lorax. But it's got worse, and now we're the adults in the room. And I was really affected by that study, and I thought, this I can't keep working on insurance clients. You know, actually, I have to be part now of turning this thing around. And so I thought, actually, the fastest way for me would be to just talk to someone every week about climate change. And if anyone wanted to listen to it, that would be a bonus. Aren't we bombarded with stories and bad news and terrifying statistics about climate change? I mean, did, did that go through your mind as you were deciding you're going to quit quit your job and dedicate yourself to, yeah, to the, trying um, to make a difference? Yeah. Uh, there are lots of stories and they get worse, right? And And it's appropriate that that news is reported 
and read and watched and acted on because we can't gild the lily. We are facing a, a, an existential crisis about the state of our, the way we live, particularly in the first world. So we're right to be worried, to be uh, concerned and, and in some cases to be grieving. Uh, um, there is this phenomenon, you probably know about it, called eco-grief. No, I don't. Tell me about it. Well, eco-grief is the psychological phenomenon that's um, experienced by people right at the edge of climate crisis or an environmental crisis, it's particularly reported amongst indigenous populations who, for them living in their whenua or in their place, that is their identity. It's their sense of worth. It's where their spiritual wealth comes from is this place. And if the place is changing out of their control and in a way that disrupts their food chain, their way of life. It might be that they're, um, well, we just know, for instance, recently in the news in Taranaki, there's an urupa that is now being steadily eroded by a rising sea. And this is repeated around the world with indigenous populations. And it's profoundly uh, sad and you can't just pack up and leave. You think about Tuvalu or Kiribati, you know, those places are going underwater and that's their home. So um, people in science or in environmental campaigning report the same sort of profound grief about the level of disruption that's happening in nature. Well, Nikki, what sort of myths did you bust? I didn't really get green hydrogen. I'm going out on Auckland's Waitamata Harbour with some of the crew from Emirates Team New Zealand on their newest support boat. Of course, these little boats that chase behind, and they're all super high-powered diesel um, speedboats. So they're really, really climate-unfriendly. So there's this project to make them climate-friendly. Right, we better get on. Absolutely. I'm just going to start it up, actually, so there'll be a little bit more underway. They told me how, when they went into the project they thought that battery would be fine because everybody thinks that the alternative to diesel is battery and then battery was just really weak and pathetic. You can't power a high-powered speedboat with an electric battery. That's where the green hydrogen came in. Taking on a bit of speed, 34. And actually since doing that one, I've talked to someone who's doing green ammonia. So this is just really, really early stages. But that's for things like ships where... Green hydrogen isn't very good because the volumes are enormous and batteries obviously wouldn't work at all. So that's been really interesting that it's not just one or the other, it's all sorts of different things that might work. There was the other thing that I found out, it was a myth actually, but it was what I didn't understand, and that's around the emissions trading scheme. So I stupidly thought that the emissions trading scheme was about buying forests. So I assumed that the the offsets were forests. But actually, obviously, if we had enough trees to offset all the emissions, we wouldn't need a we didn't wouldn't have a problem. So most of the units in the emissions trading scheme are like made up units. They're financial instruments. So the government kind of went, if you're polluting, you can buy one of these units. But they're kind of made up. They're just a financial. So you buy it and all the other polluters buy it. And then, a bit like musical chairs, every year they take away one of the chairs. So let's say there are 100 units, but next year there are only 99 units and 98 units and 97 units until no units sort of at 2050. And the theory is that polluters have to get their emissions down because there are going to be less polluting emissions um, reduction things to buy. Mm -hmm. But what people are saying is that it's not really working, that they're still being used as a cop-out for reducing your emissions. You offset, and so people are starting to talk less and less about forests being good. The other myth that I think it needs to be busted is that you can't make a difference, and you can. You can make a difference. I love this philosophy called regeneration. Have you come across that? No. So regeneration is, it changes the formula. It, it, instead of facing the threat of climate change and being overwhelmed, it, it really empowers people to say, Actually, little every little act makes a difference. You know, climate change is overwhelming. It's it's so big, it's disempowering. You see things happening in Paris and in Glasgow, and you think, well, that's other people, big fancy people making decisions. Actually, the philosophy of regeneration says every act will um, build on itself, and so the regenerative movement says that 
whatever you do, just try and leave the world a little better than what you encountered it in the first place. It's, it's having a really profound effect in New Zealand farming, for instance. Mm. Um, so farmers have embraced regenerative farming as a philosophy, and yeah. um, it really fits the farmer mentality, which is a love of nature, uh, intergenerational responsibility, a love of soil in particular. That soil is is kind of the birthplace of life. And this is the same also with Māori, you know, that soil, Papatuanuku, you know, that's where life comes from. So the emphasis on regeneration is around, well, what, what are the little things that we can do that restore, even in our gardens, even in our apartments, what can we do that just leaves the world a, a fraction better? And are there any particular stories from your 90-odd that you've done, your interviews that you've done, that really, really you know, just blew you away. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's an interesting challenge. I always like the tech stories because I, you know, I'm a bit of a nerd and I like, I like the application of um, technology to try and solve wicked problems. Um, there was one that we did recently um, with the Climate Venture Capital Fund, which I am involved in, so disclaimer uh, of interest, but there's a company called Cleanery. Have you come across no. them? So it's a New Zealand company. And they have re- basically replaced household detergents with sachets of powder. So instead of buying a plastic bottle, which is 95% full of water and 5% some sort of cleaning, acting kind of chemical, they've just figured out how you can produce this chemical or the suite of chemicals in a powdered form in a, in a paper sachet. Let's say you've got a, a, some other cleaning product and you yeah. run out. You can just put the cleanery powder in there, shake it up with water and presto. Why that matters is because that simple act, which seems so obvious, saves a really huge amount of emissions on transport. So in one container they can get 160,000 equivalent of bottles just in sachets. But also you're not manufacturing another plastic bottle that's going to go to landfill. To me, those kind of simple changes in the way that we can manufacture things, can invent things, at the mainstream they create a kind of a mass effect. Mm. And what we need is we need that in transport and in computing. I'm just looking at the stuff on my desk. We need it in timber and plastics and so on. And there are those inventors out there. Are there enough of them, though? Are there enough of them to make sure that by 2050 we, you know, reach that target? There are plenty enough entrepreneurs, there are plenty enough ideas. The lack is in the ability to commercialise and scale, Mm -hmm. and that requires capital, so it requires investment, but it also requires, sometimes it might require a change in policy or in the way systems work, and you think about transport, for instance. To get us onto bikes, we have to create safe riding infrastructure that separates us from cars. We also have to have the bikes, so the e-bike is being transformative, but you can have an e-bike and still feel terrified on the roads. Or you can have a section of cycleway that's still a death trap at the beginning and the end. You know, there's a whole sort of nest of problems that have to be resolved so that the problem is the lack of integration mm. and the systematic putting together of solutions that because all these bits depend on each other. Did it make you think, right, I've got to buy an electric car, I've got to buy solar panels, you know, I've got to turn my life upside down and try to be carbon zero? One of the brilliant things that I found, so I've wanted to have solar panels for ages. I did a podcast ages ago about solar panels. I thought, these are so cool and I have a battery and it'll be just awesome. And then I went to the council and they said, oh, sorry, you can't put solar panels on your roof because you can view them from the road and you're a you're a nice villa and we're not going to allow you. And I was sort of a bit sad about that. And then I did this podcast and I talked to Andrew Eagles, who's the head of the Green Building uh, Council, and he was going, solar panels, well... Basically, all these houses that are um, drafty and cold and inefficient and, you know, really bad for the environment because to heat houses like my house, um, I have to, you know, use heat at peak times and that means that they have to turn Huntley on and that means that they might have to build another power station. So really, my house is really bad and solar panels are not the answer. 
um, even with a battery. You know, he's saying, get your house, get your act together, Nicky Mando, and make your house more efficient, more insulated, get rid of the drafts, and then not only will you have a healthier home, but you will have a greener home. And the other thing on the same topic, Fletcher Building is building a 1.5 degree home and they've got solar panels on the house, but they haven't got a battery because at the moment batteries cause too much carbon in the way that they're produced and in the way that they are got rid of. So you can't justify putting a battery on a home when it's every bit of carbon is important. So it changed the way I thought I yeah. should do to make my home more efficient. One other thing I thought about was my workplace. So you and I, we both work in, you know, offices and it had never really occurred to me that maybe we write about climate change all the time and yet I don't think my newsroom has got a climate change plan. I don't know, maybe RNZ has a climate change plan. But it did make me think about that. Maybe if we are going to be serious about writing about climate change and emissions reduction, perhaps as an office, we should be looking into it. OK, watch out, newsroom. <laughs> you met a lot of people on the way while you were making this podcast series. Who left you really wowed? I think that was Perry Drysdale. So she's from Untouched World. In an industrial area somewhere near Christchurch Airport, Perry Drysdale is living proof that running a profitable, environmentally focused business is possible. The reason why we feel really good about these machines is that there's almost zero waste. So she founded her company in 1981 and it, it was using wool, but it wasn't particularly on a sustainability thing. But, you know, she started traveling around the world and she was looking at, you know, there was a lake in Canada where she went one year when she was on her selling trip and it was all clean and green, she thought. And the next year there was a sign going, you can't swim in this lake. And she just started seeing with her own eyes what was happening in the world as she was traveling around. And, and she kind of went, I can't be part of this and we need to be changing. And at the time, people said to her, that's rubbish. You know, nobody's nobody's interested in this. Nobody cares about this. And it was all about GDP and the financial crisis and companies' bottom lines. And it was not about sustainability. But she just thought, I'm going to do it anyway. But one of the things I was particularly interested by, she said, you've got to balance what you can do and keeping your company afloat. So she gave an example of there was a jacket that they were making and the lining of the jacket, to make it sustainable, it was going to have to be silk at this stage. And that was going to make it so expensive that nobody was going to buy her jacket. They were going to buy other people's jackets and maybe those companies were less sustainable. So she kind of went, oh, sorry, we're not going to be able to make a sustainable lining. She says you've got to balance yeah, sustainability and being a successful company. And she's sort of done that, and it, but is continuing to, to move along that track. And I was super impressed with um, mm. talking to her. She was amazing. Knowing what you know, Vince, have you changed your life much? We eat less meat. All the evidence shows that meat and agriculture are major contributors to greenhouse gas emissions. I think the most profound change for me has been my e-bike. Everyone who is in the e-bike business talks about this e-bike smile. Have you heard that expression? <laughs> no, but I, I know what you mean because I've got one and, and it's, um, it's like a toy. It's a play you, thing. You feel like a kid again. Yeah. Honestly, the joy of it. And I, this is what I'm talking about, about sort of articulating a better alternative, a better future. Getting out of your car feels threatening. It's upsetting feels uncomfortable until you get on an e-bike on an e-bike and you realize how wonderful it is that's it for today i'm sharon brett kelly the detail is public interest journalism funded through nz on air and produced by newsroom for rnz you can download us free to your mobile device every weekday from any podcast platform Today's episode was engineered by Jeremy Ansell and produced by Sarah Robson. And thanks to Nikki Mando and Vincent Herringer. Kakite anō. <laughs>